24 7 um, having to do with uh, medical cannabis and therapeutic research. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, you folks know the subject matter that we're dealing with. A lot of news on that today. Um, uh, and Co chair, why don't we uh, very quickly go around and introduce ourselves and uh, we'll get started with a, a walkthrough of the uh, delete all that's before us, the DE4. Copies are out on the table for the public. Uh, <coughs> Matthew Bergeron, Committee Meeting, Committee Administrator, House Health and Human Services Policy. Representative Rod Hamilton from District 23, Southwest Departments. Jamie Olson from House Research. Representative Carly Moline, Chief Author of the House Bill, um, represent Northeastern Minnesota. And I'm Scott Dibble, uh, Senate Chief Author, and represent South, Southwest and a little bit of downtown Maine. Katie Kavner with Senate Council. Ken Backus with Senate Council. Suzanne Sabatka, Committee Administrator for Senator Dibble. Uh, Ted York, Legislative Assistant to Senator Dibble. Uh, Tony Lorry, State Senator, District 11. <coughs> Anybody between here and Duluth? That's right. We're three quarters of the way. Most of the I 35 corridor. And yeah, we have wonderful staff over here. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair and members, I'm going to walk through the DE4, which everyone should have in front of them. Section 1 amends Chapter 13, which is the chapter on data privacy, and is more of a technical addition to the list of data privacy statutes. Section 2 is the definition section of its new proposed coding in Chapter 152, as all of these sections are. Some of the notable definitions in this section we can start on page two at the top. Subdivision six is the definition of medical cannabis. And medical cannabis includes extracts of the entire plant of medical cannabis and only in a form delivered as a liquid, including but not limited to oil, a pill or a vaporized delivery method using oil. It also allows the commissioner, commissioner of health to add other methods, but not to add smoking as a method. Subdivision 8 is the medical cannabis product, and that includes all of the supplies related to using medical cannabis. Subdivision 11 allows for patients to have a registered designated caregiver, and there are qualifications for who can be a registered designated caregiver. The person has to be at least 21 years old, does not have a conviction for a disqualifying felony offense that is also defined in this section and has been approved by the commissioner to assist a patient who has been identified by their health care practitioner as developmentally or physically disabled and therefore unable to self-administer medication. On page 3, subdivision 14 is the qualifying medical condition. Qualifying medical conditions for these purposes include cancer, <coughs> but only if the underlying cancer condition or its treatment produces one or more of the following, either severe or chronic pain, nausea or severe vomiting, or cachexia and severe, or severe wasting. Other qualifying medical conditions include glaucoma, HIV AIDS, Tourette's, ALS, seizures, including those characteristic of epilepsy, severe and persistent muscle spasms, including those characteristic of multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, a terminal illness, which is defined as having a probable life expectancy of under one year, if the illness or treatment produces one or more of the following, and is the same list that applies to a diagnosis of cancer. And finally, the Commissioner of Health is allowed to add any other medical condition or its treatment. Section 3 of the bill provides for limitations. The bill does provide for criminal protections for patients, caregivers, parents, and others allowed in the bill to possess medical cannabis. Section 3 provides limitations to those criminal exceptions, and it prohibits any person from engaging in 
um, anything that would constitute negligence or professional malpractice. It also prohibits possessing or engaging in the use of medical cannabis on a school bus or van, on the grounds of any preschool or primary or secondary school, in any correctional facility, or on the grounds of a child care facility. Section 3 also limits where a patient can vaporize medical cannabis. Those limitations include on any form of public transportation, where the vapor would be inhaled by a non-patient minor child, or in any place and include in any public place and includes a definition of a public place. Section 3 also provides limitations for operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of medical cannabis and states that it does not require medical assistance or Minnesota care to reimburse for those expenses. Section 4 allows patients in Minnesota to join a federally approved clinical trial if one does come into existence in Minnesota and it allows the Commissioner of Health to not allow any of those patients into the registry program that this bill is creating. Section 5 lists the commissioner duties, and it requires the commissioner of health to register two in-state manufacturers for the production of all medical cannabis in the state. These have to be registered by December 1, 2014. This section does allow for the commissioner to continue accepting applications should there not be a qualified manufacturer registered in that timeline who hasn't come forward with an application. And it also requires the commissioner to register either new manufacturers or re-register existing manufacturers by December 1st of each year. As a condition of registration, this is, we're now on page five, line three, so as a condition of registration, a manufacturer has to agree to begin supplying medical cannabis to patients by July 1st, 2015. The section also provides factors for the Commissioner of Health to consider when registering a manufacturer and choosing which manufacturer to register. Subdivision 2 requires the Commissioner of Health to review and publicly report on medical and scientific literature that has been published regarding the range of recommended dosages for each of the qualifying medical conditions and also a range of the chemical compositions of the plant. This needs to be published on the Department of Health website and told to the manufacturers. Moving on to page 6, subdivision 3 provides the deadlines for the Commissioner of Health. It also allows the Commissioner of Health and the manufacturer to ask for an extension of certain deadlines. If they ask the task force to extend certain deadlines, they will be extended for one month, or excuse me, six months, and can only be extended one time. Section 6 requires the Commissioner of Health to adopt rules to implement these sections and allows for expedited rulemaking for certain rules. Section 7 establishes the Patient Registry Program under this bill. The Patient Registry Program is to evaluate data on patient demographics, effective treatment options, clinical outcomes, and quality of life outcomes for the purpose of reporting on the benefits, risks, and outcomes regarding patients with the qualifying medical condition and their engagement in the therapeutic use of medical cannabis. Under this section, the Commissioner of Health is required to give notice to healthcare practitioners in the state who are eligible to serve as healthcare practitioners under the registry program. They need to provide certain information to these healthcare providers and create certifications for the healthcare provider to use in the event that a healthcare practitioner does certify that a patient has a qualifying medical condition. This section also requires the Commissioner of Health to conduct research and studies based on the data from the health records that healthcare practitioners will be submitting to the Commissioner of Health through the registry system and publish this information in major scientific journals and give the results to the legislature as well. On page 7, line 29, 
There are conditions under which the commissioner may add a new delivery method or add a qualifying medical condition. And it requires the commissioner of health to come to the legislature with that information. And the legislature can deny the additions to those lists. <coughs> Moving on to page eight, there is a patient application that every patient will need to fill out in order to become a part of the registry program. Part of the patient application is a copy of a certification from the patient's health care practitioner that is dated 90 days before the submission, or within the last 90 days before the submission of the application, certifying that the patient does have a qualifying medical condition. On page 8, line 30, this is for the registered designated caregiver and requires the Commissioner of Health to register one designated caregiver for patient, as I mentioned earlier, if the patient is developmentally or physically disabled so that they, can, they are not able to self-administer medication. Subdivision 5 is for parents and legal guardians. Parents and legal guardians are separate from the registered designated caregiver, but can provide care to the patient under this section. Subdivision 6 relates to patient enrollment. A patient's enrollment in the registry can only be denied if they do not have a certification from a healthcare practitioner that they do have a qualifying medical condition, if they've not signed certain disclosure forms required under this bill, if they did not provide other information required, or if they've been previously removed from the registry have provide, or have provided false information. If the commissioner does deny entrance into the registry program, they need to give the patient a written reason for the denial. Moving on to page 10, the commissioner shall develop a registry verification. This registry verification happens after the commissioner has enrolled a patient in the registry program. The registry verification goes to the healthcare practitioner identified in the patient's application, to the patient, and also to the manufacturer. On page 10 is a list of information required in the registry verification. <coughs> Section 8 is the healthcare practitioner duties under this bill. The healthcare practitioner, prior to a patient's enrollment in the registry program, needs to determine whether or not the patient suffers from a qualifying condition and also whether they are unable to self-administer medication and therefore in need of a registered designated caregiver. And also to advise the patients of certain information and give warnings regarding the, um, the a Tennyson warning and other such information. Once a patient has been enrolled in the program, the healthcare <coughs> practitioner will be notified of that enrollment and will continue to participate in the patient registry program under the guidance of the commissioner and report health records of the patient throughout the ongoing treatment for the underlying condition to the commissioner of health through the registry program. The healthcare practitioner is also required to determine on a yearly basis if the patient still can continues to suffer from the qualifying medical condition. Section 9 is the manufacturer of medical cannabis duties. As I mentioned earlier, there is a requirement of two manufacturers within the state. Each manufacturer is allowed or er, is required to operate up to or er, excuse me, required to operate four distribution facilities. This can include the manufacturer's main location where cultivation and harvesting and packaging of the medical cannabis will take place, but it does not have to. The manufacturers shall have at least four locations throughout the state in which to dispense the medical cannabis. Moving on to page 12, the medical cannabis manufacturer is required to enter into a contract with the laboratory subject to the commissioner's approval. The laboratory is to test medical cannabis as to the content and for contamination and to verify that the medical cannabis meets the requirements under this section.
The manufacturer has several requirements that they have to abide by in order to continue to remain registered. These include security requirements and not sharing office space with practitioners, not permitting certain employees to work for the facility, <coughs> and not operating any facility within 1,000 feet of a school, and also complying with signage and marketing requirements set up by the commissioner. Subdivision 2 relates to the production of medical cannabis and requires a manufacturer to provide a reliable and ongoing supply of medical cannabis needed for the registry program. It requires the manufacturer to have all cultivation, harvesting, manufacturing, packaging, and processing of the medical cannabis to take place in a closed, locked facility. And it also requires the manufacturer to process and prepare the, act, the medical cannabis into a form that is allowed under this bill, which again is pill or liquid including oil. Subdivision 3 relates to the distribution of the medical cannabis. Medical cannabis can be distributed to a patient, to a patient's parent if the patient is under age 18, or to a patient's registered designated caregiver. Prior to distribution, the manufacturer does need to verify that they've received the registry verification from the Commissioner of Health for that individual patient, and also verify that the person requesting distribution is related to that registry verification. The manufacturer is also required to have a licensed pharmacist, at least one licensed pharmacist, on staff. The licensed pharmacist will consult with each individual patient in order to determine the proper dosage and the range of chemical compositions for that individual patient. The manufacturer is required to provide labels on any packaging released to a patient, designated caregiver, or parent and to properly package the materials. Moving on to page 14, subdivision four requires each manufacturer to submit a monthly report to the Commissioner of Health. The report needs to include the amount and dosage of medical cannabis that have been distributed, the chemical composition of the medical cannabis, and the tracking number that had been assigned to any of the medical cannabis that was distributed. Section 10 is the patient duties under this bill. A patient is required to uh, have an annual registration and pay an annual registration fee to be involved in the registry. And as a condition of continued enrollment, patients agree to continue to receive regularly scheduled treatment for their qualifying medical condition from the healthcare practitioner they identified in their application report changes in their qualifying medical condition to their health care practitioner. And the patient is also required to only receive medical cannabis from a registered manufacturer that can receive medical cannabis products from a distributor other than a registered manufacturer. Section 11 relates to the data practice and data privacy sections of this bill. Section 12 provides for protections for involvement in the registry program. Protections include a presumption that a patient enrolled in the registry program is engaged in the authorized use of medical cannabis. Subdivision 2 is for criminal and civil protections and states that the following are not included as violations under Chapter 152 of Minnesota law. Again, these civil or these criminal protections are subject to the limitation section earlier in the bill. Use or possession of medical cannabis or products by a patient enrolled in the registry program or possession by a registered designated caregiver or a parent or guardian of a patient under 18 are protected from criminal liability. Possession, dosage determination, or sale by either the medical cannabis manufacturer, their employees, or the laboratory conducting the testing, and also possession of medical cannabis or medical cannabis products by any person while carrying out the duties under this bill. <coughs> medical cannabis and related property are also not subject to civil forfeiture under Minnesota law. There are protections for 
liability with the Board of Medical Practice, the Board of Nursing, or any other professional licensing board for professionals under this bill, and also civil protections for state agencies. Moving on to page 16, subdivision three, discrimination is also prohibited under this bill for patients based on their status as an enrolled patient in the registry program. And this includes school and landlord protection, also relating to organ transplants and job protection in hiring and termination and condition of employment as well. Section 13 provides for new criminal liabilities and civil liabilities under the bill for intentional diversion of medical cannabis by a patient to anyone that is not involved in the registry program. On page 18, section 14 relates to nursing facilities, boarding care homes, and assisted living facilities, and allows those facilities to adopt reasonable restrictions for the use of medical cannabis for patients living in those facilities. On page 19, section 15 is for the fees collected under this bill, and the commissioner does collect an enrollment fee of $200 from patients, and again, that is an annual fee. If the patient attests to receiving Social Security Disability, Supplemental Security Insurance payments, or being enrolled in a medical assistance or Minnesota Care program, then the fee is $50 annually. A medical cannabis manufacturer is also allowed to charge patients enrolled in the registry program a reasonable fee for costs associated with the operations of the manufacturer. Section 16 is on the impact assessment of medical cannabis therapeutic research. This section establishes the task force on medical cannabis therapeutic research. This is a 23 member task force with the membership listed on pages 19 and 20. The task force completes several different reports including the impact assessment listed on page 20, subdivision two. and also the cost assessment on page 20, subdivision three. Subdivision four requires the task force to issue reports to the legislature. By February 1st of 2015, a report on the design and implementation of the registry program is due to the legislature, and every two years thereafter, a complete impact assessment described on page 20 is due to the legislature. Upon receipt of the cost assessment from a commissioner of a state agency, the task force will also submit that report to the legislature. Section 17 is the financial examination and pricing reviews and instructs that a medical, can medical cannabis manufacturer shall maintain detailed financial records and allows for a certified annual audit of the medical cannabis manufacturers. Section 18 adds medical cannabis as defined in Chapter 152 to the list of uh, the um, exclusions from the drug formulary. <coughs> Section 19 instructs the Commissioner of Health to adopt the rules relating to individuals who are not authorized to possess medical cannabis under these sections and are found in possession of the medical cannabis. These rules need to establish requirements for law enforcement and healthcare professionals to report incidents involving an overdose of medical cannabis to the Commissioner of Health. Section 20 instructs the Commissioner of Health to consider the addition of intractable pain, as defined in Minnesota law, to the list of qualifying medical conditions under, the, under Section 152, Subdivision 14, prior to the consideration of adding any other qualifying medical conditions. Section 21 is the appropriations for the Medical Cannabis Research Act. 2,795,000 is appropriated in fiscal year 2015 from the general fund to the Commissioner of Health for the cost of administering these sections. 
24,000 is appropriated to the Legislative Coordinating Commission for the purposes of the task force. And 100,000 is appropriated in fiscal year 2015 from the state government special revenue fund to the Department of Health. Section 22 is the effective date and states that sections 1 through 21 are effective the day following final enactment. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Uh, committee, uh, what is your pleasure? We can pause now for um, questions um, and clarifications, or we can go to public testimony. Um, uh, Representative Lean was wondering about the fiscal note. You do find that at your place, the, um, um, the, the high-level summary of the fiscal note um, is, is uh, the numbers that were reflected in the appropriations section. Um, there was a, an analysis done. So the fiscal note, uh, the, the final fiscal note had been done on the House bill as passed uh, the House floor. Um, it was, um, it took another look at it. Uh, with the changes made by the delete everything and concluded that um, there are no substantial changes to the fiscal note. Folks want more detail than that on the fiscal note? <coughs> Seeing none. All right. Great. Um, questions, members, or uh, Senator Pearson? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Looking at the language under Section 9, uh, the manufacturer section, manufacturer requirements section, and I think I'm reading this correctly. Uh, each manufacturer uh, can operate up to four distribution facilities, but not only can, they shall. And so that should be interpreted that each manufacturer is required uh, to, to have four distribution uh, points. Is that the correct reading of the, of the bill? Uh, Senator Pearson, that is correct, yes. One of my concerns, thank you, Mr. Chair, one of my concerns is um, the members go to page six of the critical assumptions that are built into the fiscal note. Uh, you can see that we're at an estimated monthly enrollment of just about 5,000, even 5,020. Um, staff, um, has, if you read the paragraph below that, actually says that this estimate may be higher than our actual enrollment because Arizona permits cannabis to be smoked uh, while this legislation doesn't. One of my concerns, just one of, the, one of my many concerns, but this is more of a practical one in terms of implementing this in the state of Minnesota, is that um, by way of requiring uh, geographic distribution of, dis of, of, of dispensary points um, and the very low number of people that we're going to have enrolled in the program is that we are not positioning the, the manufacturers and the entities that would be required to actually implement this program in, in an economically viable way. Not to speak to the 33,000 patients who are being left out of the bill entirely, but I, I'm afraid that nobody, uh, we, or at least at this point, that we can guarantee that anybody is going to be served by this legislation. And I guess I'd be curious as well to that point, what, uh, what manufacturers have been able to look at this bill given the fact, uh, again, that many, the public has just seen the bill, seen the language, um, what manufacturers have actually given any sort of assurance that they would in fact be able to deal with this model and this distribution system, give, and, 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 and particularly with the estimated number of enrollees um, in Minnesota. And, and, and I guess, again, getting to my more global concern, which is that this may not be a, a, a viable uh, framework for distribution. Um, so this is the manufacturer so, right. question. Who, has, given the fact that this hasn't been public, um, has a manufacturer seen this and given assurance that, they, that this is actually viable? And then if, if you could expand on that a little bit, again, given the fact that we may not even have 5,000 enrollees total, and you're mandating four physical locations with a considerable capital expenditure and a requirement that a pharmacist be at each one of those, which aren't, which aren't cheap, and I would imagine some liability, that, that we could even implement this, let alone a broader more expansive system. So, um, to your 
first question, who has, uh, you know, which, which manufacturers have, have taken a look? Um, the spill is, is not, um, uh, is, is somewhat similar to the, the previous version, although the, uh, of the House bill, the previous version, of course, was limited to three. I do know that Representative yeah. Amin or some, some other <coughs> had some contact uh, with folks. Um, I don't know if, if the change in assumptions modify how they would feel about um, the business, their business prospects here in Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Senator Peterson, we did in the house model, which was essentially the estimate, same number of patients, a little over a $5,000 estimate. We had a couple different manufacturers look at the language um, and were interested in, and have had conversations with um, myself and I know the Department of Health as well, and said that they would come to Minnesota based on that model. Um, so the same patient load. They actually themselves wanted two manufacturers in the state, they thought for a healthy um, competition sort of aspect of it. So they felt though, even though the patient estimate was around 5,000, that um, having two manufacturers would be good and having additional dispensing sites. So we have had that conversation with uh, manufacturers in other states who um, looked at the house languages that came off the floor, which um, all factors are same or similar to the language that we have here in that regard. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Representative Moline, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, one more question then. Do we have uh, an, estimate, an, an estimated cost to start this program? Not only the public expenditure, but the private expenditure in order to get this system up and running. I've heard 10 million, when you look at the, the private and the public expenditure, is that is that a fair number? Is that in the ballpark? Um, Senator Peterson, I, I just don't know. I think I've heard numbers like that. Um, you know, of course, you know, getting started. Um, any business is significant capital efforts. Um, typically takes um, some financing and then it takes a number of years. To, uh, to satisfy that financing, um, and I think that's what folks intend. Um, you know, who would come here would expect that they would have investors or financing of some sort, and then take a number of years to, um, you know, satisfy those loans, um, <coughs> turning the corner and, and seeing profitability. Do you know, Representative Lynn? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Peterson, I think it's hard to know. Um, offhand, we have a application price for the manufacturers, which is not that um, different from other states. And you know, we've also, through our research, discovered that um, many states require potential manufacturers or dispensaries to post a pretty sizable bond um, before they are even registered or even get up to running. I mean, in the millions. So, in that regard, um, there's I think less financial hurdles to set up. Um, the manufacturing under this bill. Um, although, you know, I do think that we want uh, a manufacturer that has financial stability and is able to raise capital and is able to sort of self-finance to set up um, just to bring, you know, legitimacy um, to their business. And we want, I think that would be beneficial and best serve patients as well to have that sort of structure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Another question, sort of along the same lines of whether or not we're going to have a sustainable uh, system here. You know, you look at uh, you know, five thousand divided by eight. You're talking about just six hundred, what six hundred and twelve uh, rollies per um, per area. But with the language of the bill uh, requiring each manufacturer to have four locations, and then basing the commissioner's discretion around geography uh, to make sure that people aren't driving you know, 500 miles round trip, which I am afraid may still happen uh, potentially in this bill, um, that, that you may have areas that actually have uh, enrollment numbers, and, and, and it's a very high likelihood that you're going to have areas that have enrollment numbers that are significantly lower than 600 per distribution point or dispensary location. And given the way that the, the, the language of the bill is, is constructed,